Okay, I think we are ready. So before um, Debo and Mark start the conversation, just a quick work. I think we can talk about for about uh, 40 to 50 minutes. Um, you are welcome to ask questions while the conversation is going on. You did agree, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think the way it might work is that I'll start off sort of yeah. asking okay. a few questions and then you guys will have And then we'll have tea and cake in the garden and you can continue questioning the artists yes. or just have a very easy conversation between, between yourself. So thank you for coming and it's up to you now. Okay. Hello, Neville. <laughs> <laughs> Nice to be here and uh, to join you uh, for this, this conversation. Um, possibly many of you know quite a lot of Memorial's work before. Uh, when I was asked to write a piece for, for the exhibition, um, I didn't I, I didn't realise how much of your work I did know <laughs> actually. And um, we've known each other for quite a long time since so the sort of eighties actually. And we spent a little bit of time teaching together in the school and so on. Um, so it's very nice to catch up now, you know, some 30, 30 years <laughs> later, uh, to, to be doing this. Um, there's, of course, a pretty significant element of Neville's work that isn't represented here, uh, because as, as, as you know, um, I think significant element of his work is um, what could be called socially engaged practice, working with communities and uh, different groups uh, and uh, conditions. And as Tessa Jackson has pointed out, this exhibition provides a welcome opportunity in order to show a, a more sort of personal aspect of this practice that is run and evolved throughout a very, very busy um, and successful career. And uh, it's taken that all, all over the place. Uh, and, uh, um, maybe on the UK. Um, my, my first question, really, is to you know, is any, uh, anyone else who's an artist in this room is familiar, I'm sure, with that question that you get asked when you're at a dinner party or any amount of shows. You meet a, a, a stranger and uh, they discover you're an artist. Um, and of course, they say, Oh, what kind of work do you do? <laughs> and you know, there was a time you know, in the 70s when that wasn't such a difficult question because it all seemed to be, Well, you're either a figurative artist, you're an abstract artist, you're a conceptual artist. Perhaps even experimental, uh, whatever that means. And, um, or, or you might be uh, a kinetic artist. Or, uh, there was quite a lot that you could use words that would sort of keep people happy. Really. Oh, yeah, I know, I know that. Um, and it, it's much harder now. Now, well, how do you answer that question <laughs> to a stranger? Yeah, it's it's, it's, it's an incredibly it. difficult question to answer. Um, and I don't think there is a straightforward answer. Um, but I guess one of the things that I started doing fairly early in my practice is working outside of the studio, so in all sorts of different sites and situations. And I realised quite early on, well, in one particular instance when I was working on a building site and I kind of arrived with, you know, all the power for nailing that a sculptor might have, and I realised that actually I couldn't work like that in that kind of situation. It was so you know, busy and intense and materials going here, there and everywhere and I was forever in the way. So you immediately have to think about a new way of working or how you approach that situation. And I guess what it's kind of made me realise over the years is that actually whether it's a pen in my hand, a paintbrush, a saw, a drill, a camera, they're just tools, you know, and you pick the best tools to explore the things you want to do in the most appropriate way. And I think um, the work is very diverse, and it's very diverse for that reason. I'm often responding to 
places outside of the studio where you cannot determine the best way of crisis and going forward. That's quite a long answer. It is a long answer. answer. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> and that would have, would have lost people sort of, very early on. It's no. just symptomatic, isn't it, of how difficult <laughs> it is to sort of be give somebody a simple sentence that explains what you do, you lose the ball of your metal thing. Um, there is a little point there that might, we might pick up on later, which is that practice um, that you started really at the Royal College, you know, before working on building sites, etc., not, not a studio environment, um, relied in a sense heavily on documentation. Having that camera that meant you could record it and document it and think about it later and, and, and share it, of course, with, with other people. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure there's an awful lot of things that you did at that time, which there is no record of. Yeah. And, stuff. and for, again, anyone who was making work at that time, you know, we're talking about 35 millimeter slides, so, <laughs> you know, <laughs> endless. <laughs> Difficulties of getting good quality photographs, etc., etc. Um, maybe that's still the case, but not nearly as as difficult. I think. Um, so I think, as as we know, because it's written here in the very good uh, leaflet, um, uh, you, you were born in South Africa and educated in the UK, um, and that has undoubtedly informed many things about what you do as an artist, I think we may come on, come on to talk about it, but at the moment I'd quite like to just um, ask you to share with us uh, what your sort of early influences were, what kind of set you up uh, in the early days of perhaps when you are at the RCA, what artists were perhaps informing how you were thinking about making work, we're talking about the mid-80s I guess, early yeah. 80s. Um, what things that happened, particularly in the late 60s, 70s. Um, I made a presumption in this uh, in my, in the thing that I wrote that you, you would have been interested in uh, something like Gordon Matt Clark and, and, and Smithson and so on. And, and you came back and told me a few more things, such as Joseph Boyce and so on. Mm -hmm. But perhaps you could talk a little bit about how you took on. You know, like some of the ideas and the ways of working. Well, I guess, I mean, this is going back a long time, but when I was at the Royal College, you had this beautiful, fantastic studio in South Ken. And I arrived as a student there, and I spent a lot of time looking at these white walls, feeling really confused and not knowing where to start. And uh, what I thought I'd do is go for a walk around the city, and I found this. Um, rubbish dump actually along the railway side in running into King's Cross with lots of materials. I thought I can go and play that. So I went with a hammer and a saw the next day and started playing on this site. You know, um, and it was it was eye-opening because suddenly you start becoming aware of who your audience is. People may be seeing things on the train or um, I'm, I made various bits, one which is like a domestic scene of a fireplace and went the next day and someone had planted a big sold sign in it and you realize that actually there were other people using the site at night. So then I started making work which is almost in dialogue with the kind of homeless people using the site at night. And some of those experiences really changed my thinking and changed a lot of the artists that I was looking at. Uh, and I think for me, and I mentioned it to you before, uh, Joseph Boyce's performance with a coyote was absolutely central in, in a lot of that early thinking. I just think, so um, I, I don't know if any how many of you are aware of that piece, but it was a piece he made in New York where he put himself in a closed room with a coyote and he stayed there for a number of weeks. And at the moments of, there were moments when the coyote was being quite threatening to him or he was kind of trying to drive it off. It was a very febrile, tense um, kind of piece of work. And that toing and throwing of um, a relationship between, you know, him as a kind of artist, this coyote, his audience, was something that really fascinated me and I think um, has continued to resonate. So that for me is a really significant and important piece of work, which I, I guess at that moment in time I was becoming much more aware of. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's worth remembering how important Joseph Boyce was. Absolutely. He was a major, major figure. I mean, you could probably mention him to 
students now, they wouldn't know who you were talking about. But um, it's very, very significant in that his work was political, it was certainly social, um, it was very sculptural, physical, it was land art, it, was, you know, it encompassed so many different things. Um, it was, um, you know, his great phrase was everyone is an artist, and, and uh, he certainly wasn't the first person to, to say that, and not, not, not the last either, but he, all his work was, was very, very energized and directed towards a kind of set of principles. Um, I, I guess also his, his politics was really key to yeah. my interest in him. His, so that was yeah. also part of that background. Yeah. That work, actually, by the way, it's called I Love America and America Loves Me. Yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and interestingly, all photographed by Caroline Tistel, who, um, without whom, you know, we would have known nothing about those, uh, those works. And I think, Sandy, does she have a look? Did she have to Bristol? Caroline Tistel, I think she did. Yeah, it sounds to me. She did, she definitely did. Um, 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 in terms of this exhibition, then, I mean, we're already kind of pointed out there's, there's um, it, it's a more sort of personal look at, at your practice, but it also uh, covers nearly 30 years yeah. um, and includes some, I would say, pretty, some key works um, and, uh, and less uh, and some more. Uh, uh, not call them minor words, but you know, smaller uh, studio drawings and so on. Um, how did you approach it? This 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 show. Well, I guess this is the third show that I've had at Daniel's Gallery. I love the gallery. I love the space. I love the domesticity of the space. Uh, and actually. Um, Last year, Tessa Jackson, who also wrote the text in there, asked me to include a piece of work which is in that corridor or Nachum's coat in an exhibition she was putting together of um, artist self portraits. And I was very anxious about showing that work at all, not to me, I've been seen before, but um, after, after having seen it in that context, um, I was really keen to show it again here with Danielle's. And the rest of the work, the rest of the exhibition, really to large extent feeds off that piece of work. Um, so it's a very personal piece of work, as I said, apart from Tessa's show in here, it's never been seen before. Um, and it, it really set the agenda for everything else that I've included. Do you want to say a little bit more from that? Because to me, that work stands out as being quite different from the rest of the work. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and register. And um, I mean, it's also the work I didn't know. Yes. Compared to most of the rest of Germany, which yeah. I do. So, in terms of how it set the tone, do you want to say a bit more? Well, I, I guess so. The, the, to say a little bit more about the piece of work, um, Nachum was my uh, grandfather's brother uh, in Latvia, um, and um, my Jewish name when I was eight days old was given to me as Nachum. Um, he didn't survive the war, but had he survived the war, um, he would have been 59 in the year that I was born. So on my 59th birthday, I wanted to make a piece of work which looked back at this man who I never met, I only knew in one photograph, but who was a kind of namesake for. So um, based on that photograph, I went to a really high-end tailor in London who um, Looked at, the, looked at the picture, told me so much more about that image than I knew. For example, the coat didn't fit him, it was far too big, so it was either begged, borrowed, or belonged to the studio for the photograph. He told, you know, there was lots of detail, but he, he could understand what was going on in that image in a way in which I couldn't. And he then made the coat and the clothing based on that photograph. And I used that to take a photograph of myself <laughs> looking back at Nachum. So in a sense, it was a dialogue with the past because perhaps they never met. Um, but I felt that, you know, based on that, a lot of the other works that are in here are also essentially self-portraits. 
Mm. So for me, the connection was that notion of um, you know, that self-portrait or revealing, or you know, exploring or revealing something which is very, very private. I mean, a lot of these works are quite private works and not really seen. So I have, a, as an artist, I've got a public persona, which is, as you said, the large commissions, but I always have had a studio practice. It's always been really important to keep that going. But lots of the works that I do in my studio often have been seen. <laughs> so the connection is very much that notion, that kind of private inner. Yeah, yeah, got it. Yeah, that's good. I mean, regardless of whether it's uh, commission work or, or more personal private work, um, a lot, a lot of the work seemed to me to involve your you setting yourself a task, yeah, uh, or a proposition, and then setting it out to think, well, how do, how do I do this? How, how do I set this up? And they may be situated in in a very particular place. Um, South Africa, in the middle of nowhere, or they may be in, in the studio environment and so on. Um, they function as, as performances and uh, uh, documented and recorded, and, um, and there can be different versions of these performances mm -hmm. that you might do and, and redo and, and, and in different places. Um, the common denominator very often is is the camera, as we said earlier, and uh, um, in, in that case, the video using the video recording. And I and, and I think invariably the, the camera is fixed. Yeah, a static <laughs> camera. There's no kind of clever business uh, in terms of filming. Um, you, you do use, um, you are editing the film quite, quite heavily in, in, in some cases. So I just uh, wondered if you could tell us a little bit about your approach to film um, and using the camera and, um, and also of course sound that, mm. that has come into the work perhaps more than you might have done in the, in the past. Yeah. Um, uh, so yeah. Well again, I guess, uh, yeah. It all goes back to the Royal College again. When I was working off sites, uh, I could never get any tutors to come out and see what I was doing in a rubbish dump in Finchley. So I always had to bring something back to show them. So the camera immediately became a kind of a, a practical tool. Uh, and then the kind of interest in documentation grew. So you're kind of thinking, well, what's on the edge of the frame? What's left there? What's above it? So you start thinking about what actually the photogrammetic image is and means. Uh, and that's kind of extended, I guess, into the film work. So for me, um, usually if I'm doing a performative piece in the middle of the countryside, well, Joe might be standing behind the camera for, you know, in case I fall or injure myself. But beyond that, um, it's a, it's quite a private moment. I don't want it to be, um, you know, fancy cameras, very elaborate. I want to, want to keep that process as simple as possible. It's a content rather than the process, uh, the, the technology that's fascinating yeah. me. I mean, I, I have made very sophisticated films, just recently showed one in Manchester with huge budgets, but that's a different thing. Yeah. Um, for me, this is about keeping the technology to a minimum and really exploring an idea in a context. Yeah. Okay, I'm sure that might be something um, that you might not be up on. Um, and so, these are probably, yeah. Go I was going to say, if you want me to say a little bit about sound or editing, I can following on. But yeah, go on. Go on. Well, I, th I think again, um, some of the performance works are really long. So, there's a piece that I did in South Africa a few years ago, standing on, ice, on an iceberg, what well, a block of ice, whilst it melted from. Mm -hmm. Dawn to Dusk, that was like uh, so long time. I don't think anyone would stand and watch that film. So some of them are, are edited. And more recently, particularly in some of the landscapes in South Africa, where you, there is silence, but you become so aware of the fact that it isn't silent. There's so many sounds going on. Um, but sound has begun to influence the work and, uh, you know, in, increasingly. Uh, and then with the performance in the front, um, uh, it was actually a work inspired by some time I spent with a woman called Mrs. Pagan, who had working urine disease, latter stages. Um, and there was a lot of kind of MRI <coughs> recordings from that. And actually the sound of the MRA um, really... 
gave a certain kind of rhythm to the way that I chose to edit the film. And I think that was, I think, you know, worth also following that. And it was very Um, an amazing film of Jackson Pollock making <laughs> these paintings <laughs> on the floor um, um, with Lee Krasner nearby, you know, directing things, no doubt. And I think the filmmaker was uh, back with hands in the move. But in a way, we can't think about Jackson Pollock's paintings anymore without <laughs> thinking about that film. Uh, <laughs> but it's such a profound. Different is. kind of experience, and it strikes me that your performances are often about, in fact, your work generally is often about painting. It, 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 it isn't about the final image necessarily, but it's about a process. It's very much about process. Surfaces are covered um, paint or baro or lime, graphite, whatever it is, beeswax is, is, is employed in order to actually cover a surface and to mark time or to uh, 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 encompass an area. Uh, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, starting with sculpture, I like stuff, I like yeah. materials, I like the physicality of handling materials. Yeah. And I think um, that kind of process of, of making and manipulating, um, is that runs through all the work and is absolutely central. And it's, yes, I mean, um, you you end up with you know um, a residue, but it is very much a process that kind of interest and drives. So coming back to that first question about what you say to the person at the dinner party, <laughs> in a way you could say I'm a sculptor yeah. quite confidently <laughs> yes. because yes. because and I that's what I felt when I started writing. I mean, yes. every, I said to Daniel, if I'm going to write something, it's going to be based on the premise that. Um, looking at, at Neville's work as a sculptor, really. oh, yeah. and I'm a sculptor, so perhaps that's inevitable. But because I do see that is what runs through everything in a way is this insistence um, on, on material. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but more than that is is also the body. It's yes. It's, you, so you could also say actually you're a figurative artist because I think you are in many ways. You know, you're a figurative sculptor. My God. <laughs> Not for big, but um, you could make a case for that, couldn't you? Well, I think you're absolutely. That's what I'm no, no, I think I think you, I think you could. I think it's very much about um, myself, my own physicality, and my own physicality in relation to space, place, and time. Really, those are the things that's yeah, kind of intrigued me. <laughs> so even a drawing like this, which you have to do on the floor, is a really physical process. Yeah. You know, you're kind of reaching out, you're stretching, you're lying on it. Um, and so I think um, it's flat and it's two dimensional, but it really comes out of a, you know, very much a manipulation of yeah. the material. So my last question uh, is then where that takes us metaphor, meaning what that, what that elicits and, and suggests. And it strikes me, your work, your work never shouts at us. It doesn't tell us any, you know, it doesn't tell us what to think. Um, it's, it's full of associations and full of different narratives that we can put in front of the work uh, and take away from it. Um, you, you don't, there isn't a text that goes alongside the works in, in, in many ways. Uh, Thank God, I think, personally. <laughs> so we have to confront it on its own terms. Um, well, I guess, you know, for me, when you start off making a piece of work, you start off with a series of questions, in a way, in your own head. And the making of the work is exploring of those ideas and questions. And, yeah, there isn't, actually, I'm use for black and white, there isn't a black and white answer to it um, at all. Um, but it is about... You know, wrestling with questions and ideas and through making. It is. But, but you've got to somehow, the work has to get us involved in those questions. In a way. You don't, the work isn't easy to look at in that sense, is it? I mean, you do and, and insist that your audience 
sort of participates in a yeah. way in the work. And I think I think that it, it definitely draws us in, I think, and captivates us and intrigues us. But beyond that, we really have to start working to um, connect the thread that connects all of your your yeah. I think I think that's that's probably true. Yes. Uh, I mean, I think in the context of this show, as well as putting work in, it's also why I want to include sketchbooks, objects from my studio, other bits and pieces, because in a way, that's the kind of material I've never really seen publicly in the context of an exhibition, or very rarely, but that certainly gives clues in, I think, to some of the, yeah. some of the other pieces. And there are objects in upstairs and my key cabinet back there, which are really significant objects for me, mm -hmm. live in my studio. Yeah. Um, but it won't necessarily work, but it might perhaps give people a cue. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Well, I'm going to sort of open this up to the floor a little bit here. Um, rather than just take one question at a time, could we have, um, you know, sort of collect three questions? And see if they're similar, or, or put them in groups. Um, uh, just see, see what kind of questions we're we're being asked here. Would anyone like to? Would you like to say your question? Um, I'm just curious, uh, particularly thinking about your interest in voice and his politics. If you could say a bit more about politics operating in your work and how that's linked to sort of place and space, sort of. Yeah, okay, so we're going to store that one. Voice, politics, space, mm -hmm. yeah. My, my question is very different. It's actually um, very much concerned with the, with the physicality and, and the process of, of um, the task of the endurance, the physical effort of the task and its relationship to the emerging composition, which it's fascinating to me because when I look at all the work, uh, I see like really fine composition, I really see composition of the choreography and composition, and yet it's obviously emerged through the action as opposed to kind of stepping back and considering that's mm. that's what it comes to what's right likely to be there. Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. I think. There's, a, there's a kind of formality, isn't there, in the way in which things are used and devices? Mm. Uh, is there any other question? Okay, let's start. Come back to the voice then. Oh, did you have sorry? Oh, I just, I just thought because uh, because you said something about uh, the physicality. It's um, I just wonder about the performance part of that, but it's so linked to what you were saying. So you know that that's one one thing. Yeah. Okay. Good. Well, let's come back to the, the voice and politics. Uh, well, I guess, you know, um, I'm perhaps talking politics with a small p, <laughs> but, you know, I grew up in South Africa, I grew up in apartheid in South Africa, and we left for th those reasons. Um, you cannot escape politics in that sense if you've grown up in that kind of an environment and climate. Um, you know, I also grew up in a Jewish family who have never been rooted in one place for more than a generation, looking back several generations. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think that notion of, um, you know, migration, shift, relationship to land, relationship to place, all those questions for me are, are very raw and very real. Um, and I think in some of the more public works as I do, even if I'm working you know, I don't know, I'm on a building site with a group of builders. I'm really interested in trying to understand people's own kind of relationship to, 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 to place, to community, to what that might mean. Um, and the project that I did in the Tower Block in Liverpool for five years, living in that block, was again, it was really trying to see through other people's eyes their, what place means, what their sense of being is and means. And I think... Um, you know, in that sense, there's there's a lot in what Boyce work is about and was doing, which I resonate with. So it's that kind of um, sense of politics that kind of answers your question. So, in, in, I think the important thing is not necessarily Boyce's 
works in the way he works, but his attitude is, absolutely. is, is where he put himself yes, and absolutely. how he situated himself yeah, yeah. in relation to his practice. Yes. 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 So, this question of choreography. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not anything you do with choreography, but I come from movement and dance. Yeah. So I, I kind of, I, I mean, all the work I really feel as if it's that interesting you said it's not easy, you don't find it easy. But, I mean, I do, you know, not so much easy, but I feel like I really sort of feel pulled in by a sort of physical, sort of cellular, kind of cellular, sort of visceral kind of connection to it. Because I, even with this, I see some kind of relationship between this. And, and what we think of the, the true rich, the true man performance, you know, yes. yeah. Way, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. Um, and and um, but I'm curious about, I guess, speaking about your experience of being being inside the action. So yeah. when you're you're inside the work and and you're not on the outside looking at it, mm. you're sustaining presumably you're sustaining the period of time, yeah. you know, it continuously with the composition emerging and evolving through you and out. And so it's a very different kind of compositional process that, that is coming from an embodied you know, effort for physical experience. And I'm curious about whether you know, your sense of the composition emerging as, as, you're, as you're doing that, as you're performing the act, and, yeah, I, I think it, it's it's very different in different works actually. And as I said, we're seeing some films here, but for all the films here, there's an awful lot of things that never get seen for a start, mm. but for different, mm. you know, for different reasons. And in some cases, you know, um, you're absolutely right in the sense that they are constructed. I mean, the piece in the front, I think that's that's the third iteration of the same piece of work. Mm. Um, you know, simply, you know, you begin with, you try something, it, it works, it fails, you do a second version, it, you know, mm. so I think it, it, there is a process. Yeah. Um, and in some senses, you know, one could say that that was a piece that I, you know, an iteration performance was worked with. Mm. So in that sense, it is very, um, you know, it, it's, it, it has a very clear structure and parameter. Mm -hmm. I knew what I was aiming to achieve with that. Others, others, that's much, much less the case. Mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, for example, the piece around here, this kind of painting piece. Mm -hmm. Well, again, I mean, there are different iterations of it, but also mm -hmm. sometimes you're working on something like that and it's you're out there for five, six, seven hours. You know, So if you're editing it, there is a it enters a process where it becomes slightly more formal in terms of how you manage time. Yeah, I was curious about that, whether whether they whether they were doing just in one go and you know, from beginning to end or whether you did stop in between and No no that's the, the filmed in, in one go. Right, but, right, but that, right, that right. was ed edited after well. Yeah. Um, so right. it's kind of managed afterwards mm -hmm. and so uh, I t when I'm doing that I then mm -hmm. you, you just go. <laughs> yes, um, yes. But as I said, there are there are lots of things which you feel for various <coughs> reasons might not make the grade or not be ready yet or need another iteration. So um, it, it's it's quite fluid behind the scenes, but then obviously sometimes what you show has a kind of construct. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> I think what it also I, it was a sort of question I was always had and because I think one of the devices that you use, um, and I do think you use it rather than just let it exist, is, is the way of uh, framing, the framing of things. Because if we look around, uh, it's not just put a frame around something. The thing has a frame, mm -hmm. and the frame of space that you are operating and moving within. It's very carefully choreographed actually very carefully mm -hmm. considered it's not a not a neutral no. element to the work it's of course it's sort of inevitable if you're making things through a lens and cameras and so on but you are working 
with it, whether it's you know deciding on a vertical format or a format mm -hmm. and what happens up there on those edges and so on, and your awareness of what might be outside or our awareness of what might be beyond the frame. Um, it's a very strong and uh, persistent element in the world. I think I think that clearly comes through, you know using a camera and using a camera extensively and really and looking at photography actually and very often it's what might not be in the frame but find on the edges which is really kind of something which is quite real and I'm very conscious of that when I take photographs and very formally take it. Yeah. Yeah. Actually I think it's worth drawing attention to a work that uh, um, I really love which is Skid. It's <laughs> <laughs> a purely photographic work and it yeah. also um, highlights a, a found object, if you like, mm. um, um, uh, rubber being left on the on um, mm. arm as a, as, a, as a sculpture, as a drawing, as a, uh, it's there. It's, yeah. it's, 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 um, what, what date was that work? I can't remember. So, sorry? What date was that? That's, that's quite old. It's 2007. It's very old. So yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the, because of the, the exhibition had, as I said, the trigger was Nacko's coat and everything fitted in. It seemed to me an opportunity to pick things across across a time frame. So there's, there's some old, much older pieces of work, and that's 2007. Again, very formally photographed, and I kind of loved that notion of someone, you know, in a car, it's very physical thing, you know, yeah. doing a wheelie or spinning yeah. around and leaving these amazing drawings in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. So. <laughs> so. And in, in that, but in, and your role is to be very detached in yes. a sense and simply to document what, what's in front. Absolutely, and well, mm -hmm. well yeah, God bless photographs, which some of you might yes. be aware of, that are exactly the same. Mm -hmm. You know, you, so I did this whole series. A couple of books and it's an ongoing series of photographs of improvised goalposts found in the landscape. But I photograph them exactly as I find them. If there's litter there, it stays, I don't clean them up. And they're photographed in the same place, they're very formal. That's a sense of really recommend those. I mean, that in itself, that, that kind of detachment, um, objectivity, uh, is also you saw the narrative from the 70s, I think, or we noticed or saw or, or couldn't help but be affected by, I think, mm -hmm. the, the yeah. of this at that time because yeah. that was part of an attitude, wasn't yes. it? Yes, sort of stay out of the work, you know, yes. put yourself in, in the center of it, even when you do put yourself in the center of the work, you're somebody else, you know, it, it's, yeah. a, it's a decoy, in one. yeah, and I think, yes, you know. Well, going back to those goalposts photographs, if you start manipulating them in any kind of way, shape or form, then you're really changing the relationship of the, of the post to the landscape, to the place, to yourself. And I think um, you're exactly right, so wanting to intervene, or well, not intervene in that. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Any, any more questions? I'm not sure I can see the nice corner. Don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh, did you? Did you oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> no. Okay. It's getting very dark. Yeah. There's <laughs> <It's laughs> <really dark. laughs> <laughs> a question over there at the back. Yeah. Um, hi. I'm not sure if this is a question, but it's just uh, something which um, kind of striking for me with the, like the, with the uh, exhibition starting with your uh, grandma, grandfather's brother mm. and that work. And then you were talking about self-portraiture, which is like in every single work, and the sense of belonging, and how your family never stayed longer than the generation places, and that's how it all goes back to this first work of the code, and the, the man you never had the opportunity to meet or ask the questions, and how that one specific person actually goes through all your works and goes back to you. I yeah, I'm okay. reading it. <laughs> yes, I think that's okay. That's <coughs> but uh, yeah, it's like the person you never met can actually um, uh, be catalyst for a <laughs> sense of belonging in a way. Yeah, well, I think, as I said, certainly in this exhibition, it's been a trigger for it. Yeah. 
2010 maybe it's too personal. I don't know if you have to answer or not. But <laughs> do you remember or recall the first thing you've done that you called it? This is my first part. I've, uh, I've done arts. Uh, y yeah. Like <laughs> and, and what is that awakened inside of you? I've done. I mean, the very first thing I ever made. That you remember? Yeah. Oh yeah. No, I can remember when I was kind of this big. Yeah. Um, having a lump of clay and shaping it into kind of mother of child and child thing and thinking this is amazing you know and then trying to make an aeroplane in the garden out of a pole table so um, but um so i think for, for me kind of stuff material as far back as i can remember i've really enjoyed that process but it was a way you know i i guess it's a way in which I found that I could express myself, which was really much more complex for me in words or in any other form. Um, so I think you know, those little triggers from very early on. I think I'll say that, yeah. Well, I think that um, if there are no more questions, we can uh, close the conversation for a few minutes. So maybe just by the time we go to the garden, if I continue talking. But thank you, Nebo. Thank you, Mom. Thank you very much.